Jay Jagadishan is um, from Brigham Women's Hospital, and he is going to be um, speaking about his innovative work in surgical navigation, machine vision, and augmented reality. Um, I, he's the guest editor of the Journal of Medical Robotics Research for a special issue on that was called Image Guided Intelligent Inventions. So I know we're all really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about this fascinating new world. Thanks. Thanks very much for this opportunity to speak over here. Uh, today I'll be talking specifically on the role of interoperative imaging to guide surgery to precisely resect humors. So what is the problem with conventional surgery? Conventional surgery suffers from poor visualization of the tumor, the sensitive structures around. This problem becomes even more uh, evident if for minimally invasive surgery. Interoperative imaging has become essential to improving the outcome of surgery and therapy. The reason being it provides both anatomic, physiological uh, information in real time to the surgeon, providing context-specific information to the surgeon, and allows the surgeon to see beyond the surface. This allows the surgeon to distinguish between the tumor and the healthy tissue to completely resect the tumor while uh, sparing the surrounding healthy tissue. At the Brigham and Women's Hospital, we have a unique state-of-the-art uh, operating room which has all the possible imaging modalities integrated with the operating room. You have an MR, you have a CM CT, you have a PET CT, you have ultrasound, you have molecular imaging, navigation systems. So what we do is we take intraoperative images of the patient while they're in the surgical position, provide this to our software, which is based on navigation as well as machine learning algorithms in order to clearly delineate the tumor as well as the sensitive structures around the tumor. So today I'll be talking about three specific applications where we use intraoperative imaging in order to improve the localization of the tumor and the tumor excision. The first is for lung tumor resection. So the standard of care right now is either wedge resection or a lobectomy. The standard of care uh, imaging is basically CT images. You can see an image of, uh, of a lung tumor, a very small lung tumor uh, with a ground glass opacity lesion. These tumors, because now uh, due to the CT screening, you're finding smaller and smaller tumors, and these are non-palpable tumors. The typical standard of care procedure is using three ports called VATS, and in order to localize the lesion, the surgeon inserts their finger into the thoracic cavity and tries to palpate the tissue. And you can see how crude this particular procedure is. And if you have very small lesions, specifically ground glass opacity lesions, this becomes even more difficult. So at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, what we have, so the problem right now is to localize the lesion. So, and also ensuring complete resection of the lesion and ensuring negative margins. So at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, we have started using the intraoperative imaging in using the CRM CT. With the patient in the surgical position, we first take a CRM CT of the patient. That's the lesion out here. We place these passive fiducials called T-bars. You can see the surgeon and the radiologist working together, placing the T-bars very close to the lesion. These T-bars then are used as surrogate markers in order to localize the lesion. So once the lung is deformed, it's completely deflated. You have the two wires coming out of the lung surface. These wires are then used in order to localize the lesion. So this is a way in which you, you don't need to palpate the tissue. You know precisely where the tumor is, and you can excise around the wires in order to ensure that the tumor is resected. And you should also remember that most of the lung cancer patients are also smokers. So you want to preserve as much lung function as possible while resecting out the tumor. So once the uh, lung sample is resected, we then take a CT of the lung sample to ensure that the tumor as well as the T-bars are within the lung sample. And you can see the wires, you can see the T-bar within the tumor itself out here. So we completed the first phase of the procedures. We completed 23 patients. In 87% of the patients, we had a successful placement of the fiducials. All the uh, lesions were successfully removed without any positive margins. The most important time to note is 39 minutes. That's the amount of time that is added in order to improve the, uh, the, uh, the procedure itself. The second application that I wanted to talk to you about was MR-guided breast conserving surgery. So the standard of care right now for breast conserving surgery is to make a very small incision, excise the tumor along with the surrounding tissue. Now the problem over here is that 
the breast tissue is extremely deformable. And also identifying the extent of the tumor within the lung, uh, breast parenchyma is very difficult. As you can see in the CAD images here, uh, you can see the extension of the tumor within the breast parenchyma. Now, the statistic is actually quite surprising. Nearly 35% of the procedures results in positive margin immediately after the surgery, which means that one in three patients come in for a second or a third procedure immediately after surgery. So what we are trying to do is trying to see if we can use intraoperative MR in order to reduce this positive margin rate. So the idea is to bring in the MR. So the, with the patient on the surgical table, we bring in the MR, and this is on rails. So we take a pre-procedural MR, Using the pre-procedural MR, we then plan out the excision, we plan out the extent of the lesion. We do the surgery through a very small incision. Once the lump is removed, we then fill the surgical cavity with saline. So once the, once the surgical cavity is closed, then we bring in the MR immediately after the procedure, and you can see there is a small speck of the tumor left behind in the patient. So we go back, do the second procedure with the patient on the operating table. So this obviates the need for a second or a third procedure, and this entire thing can be done in a single sitting itself. So we completed the first, so these are some of the images. This is the diagnostic images which are obtained a few days before. You can see there's a tremendous amount of displacement and deformation of the tumor itself. And this is just before the surgery. This is provided to the surgeon along with the volume rendered images. This is immediately after the surgery, you can see the surgical cavity, which completely encapsulates the tumor itself. So we do a lot of pre-processing. During the surgery, we have machine learning algorithms which detect remnant tumor immediately after the surgery and then uh, applies it as a color map on the images itself. We completed the first phase of images. 13 patients were completed. In all of the cases, the MR findings correlated with the pathology. In just one case, we, the MR was not able to detect DCIs, which is a well-known problem in the literature itself. The third application I wanted to talk to you about was MR-guided parathyroidectomy. So these lesions are benign lesions of the parathyroid gland. These are very small lesions. Typically, the parathyroid gland itself is the size of the rice grain. These lesions are slightly larger. It could easily take about 8 to 12 hours in order to find the lesion, uh, the parathyroid adenoma itself. And there are numerous stru sensitive structures around. You have the recurrent laryngeal nerve as well as the carotid artery just around the, uh, the adenoma itself. And nearly 15% of the cases results in some damage to this nerve. And this is the nerve that controls your vocal cords. So the idea in this case was again to bring in the MR, get intraoperative MR. Now in this case, we actually provide the intraoperative MR to a navigation system. So once this is done, um, so you can actually see that there is a lesion out here. It is circled in green, so this is the lesion. So once this is done, we then provide it to a navigation system. We create 3D models of the skin, the trachea, the thyroid, and the parathyroid. So in real time, as the surgeon moves the instrument in the neck, this instrument gets updated in the neck. It's almost like a GPS. And this view is the view from the tip of the instrument. So as you're sitting inside the car and looking out and looking at the different structures around. And this is the view as you're looking at the instrument as well as the surrounding and. Uh, and these are the views that are provided to the surgeon as they're doing the surgery. So we provide different forms of feedback. We have visual feedback, quantitative feedback, auditory feedback. We're looking at different ways in which we can provide the information. Because one thing we, we want to make sure is that the information provided is not excessive, and it provides only the context-specific information to the surgeon. So we completed the first phase of image, uh, the uh, clinical trials in order to prove the feasibility we completed uh, five patients. The accuracy of targeting the different structures was very good. So we also recognize that there is a tremendous amount of information provided to the surgeon. So we want to see if there is a way in which we can combine all that information. So this is using a head-mounted display, virtual reality. You can see the laparoscopic images. This is the uh, navigation system. You can also bring in all the patient images. You can look around. These are all virtual monitors. These are not real monitors. You can pull in all these images, and then you can navigate based on these images. You can identify the, where the lesion is, the extent of the lesion, plan out the resection. You can also turn off the monitors, look at the patient. So we have two cameras which are attached to the Oculus Rift in order to see the uh, patient itself. So this is some of the work that we have been doing. We've also been investigating auditory feedback, providing stereoscopic sound in such a way that the sound itself provides feedback to the surgeon on the 
the location of the tumor. They don't need to rely on the visual uh, displays itself. So finally, this has been the work of many, many people, and I just wanted to thank all the uh, people involved in this work. Thank you.